uh, simple, uh, as simple as possible, to tell you where we are going. So we have now, we have now understood uh, to a great extent how light energy converts uh, water into oxygen and produces food for you. So what can we do? We have a rising population uh, and we, uh, all petroleum is going away, uh, that was in the past. So all of us have to think about what we can do to solve this problem. And uh, I cannot, uh, this itself is a very big topic, the entire world is working on it. Uh, so it will be a very brief uh, description of some of the things that are going on uh, in that direction. So that would be uh, the theme of this talk. So let us look. So, what are the ten most important problems? Uh, we see energy is one of the top problems. Water is another problem, uh, especially in certain countries. Drought, food, of course, is will be a problem. And environment, of course, we are polluting the environment. Uh, we have a lot more and more cars, and uh, we are throwing bad things in the air. So that's uh, these are the four top problems. Of course, poverty is there, terrorism and war, of course, is a problem. And so all of these ten problems, I think, uh, United Nations listed them once uh, uh, as problem. And I also listed education because I believe that it is only through education that we, uh, we can let people know of what the problems are and where we are going. Uh, as you see, 2050 expect uh, 10 billion people and we don't have enough food. So, what are we doing? We have many, many scientists who are very much involved and interested. And I just selected a few scientists, uh, some of them I know personally, uh, I either have worked with or their friends or meet them at meetings and I know they are doing great service. So one of them here, his name is Dick Sayer, uh, same name as another Dick Sayer at Stanford where some announced postdoctoral work is going on. But this is a different Dick Sayer uh, who is interested in seeing how we can harness algae uh, for many things, for pharmaceuticals, for food, for energy, for hydrogen, you name it. And the reason uh, people select algae, or uh, he has selected algae, is because when you grow them, you're not going to compete in the farmland, you're going to grow them in other places, and therefore there is no question of competing with crop production. So that's one of the reasons. Also algae, single cell cultures, they grow very nicely. So here, here is a cartoon uh, uh, of Dick. Uh, they are standing near, near a petrol pump or gas, gasoline pump. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think when some company made it for him. And there are books like algae biodiesel, there are people who are growing algae. Here's another gentleman in Australia. And there are some laboratories who are doing research. So Dick said extracting oil from algae to produce a more sustainable biofuel, you know, the most promising and exciting area of the biofuel research. So he, they are actually trying to get the algae to make oil rather than normal food. So that's a lot of genetic engineering is involved in this, in this process. Uh, this is, uh, he has used Chlamydomonas reinhardii, a green alga, for this research, but this research is going on with all sorts of algae which can grow better than Chlamydomonas. So now, uh, there has been a discussion of corn. Should we make alcohol from corn? And so for people will say, well, if you make alcohol from corn, you're competing with food that the corn makes, and therefore it's not such a good idea. But specifically in the United States of America, we, you may not realize there's a political situation in which farmers are paid not to grow corn on their farm. Why? Because then this way they can keep the price of corn higher. If you grow too much corn, it will get cheaper and somehow the economics, uh, whoever controls it, things, is not good for economics. So they pay the farmers not to grow corn. 
So what Munir Cherin, my friend, is a professor uh, just retired recently uh, at Urbana, a professor of food technology, who has done a lot of research in, uh, on corn alcohol. He has a whole group. So the corn biofuel researchers say, in some parts of the USA, farmers are paid not to grow corn. We should let them grow and use that corn as it does not compete with corn for food. We have already the technology for it. Why not use it? So this is his thesis. Uh, now, how many people buy it or not? We don't know. But he, he is always a matter of looking at all possible ways to improve the situation. So it's one of them. And of course, he's a good friend. There's two dogs, two doors down the house. So uh, it's easy to get uh, to talk to him on this matter. Now, the other, other, other plant, I, I left out many. For instance, I left out Jatropha, which is being grown in India, and uh, there's tremendous research going on in Hyderabad uh, on Jatropha, and I was there looking at, at the results, but I don't have a slide at the moment because it's one hour talk uh, to leave it out. But I do say, but here, and Iran, I don't know what. Um, one of the things that's being studied is miscanthus. We had I don't know how many millions of dollars grant by British Petroleum given to our university to study this plant, Miscanthus. Why Miscanthus? Well, Miscanthus is a very interesting plant. It, it grows and makes tubers, uh, and you do not have to fertilize this. So we have in Urbana, Illinois, uh, one set of Miscanthus growing. Here is another plant growing. Neither of them are given water or uh, fertilizer, and you can see this miscanthus growing year and year, and the other plants are dying. I, I didn't bring the photo uh, for you, but this is the part where miscanthus is growing. So it's very, uh, very efficient, very fast grower, and you cut it out, and it grows up. And there's a story. A friend of mine uh, bought a house, and he had obviously miscanthus plant growing in his yard. He was very unhappy, very ugly, so he cut it. And he, he came to me and he said, Gomiji, what is this? This, is, this keeps growing and I have trouble. My lawn looks awful. So this is a plant which just is so easy to grow. And Professor Steve Long, who received the grant from British Petroleum, uh, uh, I'm, I'm always afraid of being recorded because I may say something that's not right. So I may be in trouble. Somebody may put me in jail or something. I hope not. But uh, it's okay. Uh, I mean, I can go to jail if I say something wrong. Uh, so what 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 they did, what he shows, is that this plant is not only is a C4 plant, is not only good in high temperature, but it's good at low temperature. And they are species growing in Siberia of miscanthus. And now the University of Illinois has collected I don't know how many of these strains from all different parts of the world were of this plant. Therefore, there's a future University of California at Berkeley, University of Illinois. They have worked together. The work at Illinois is finished. And now Berkeley will start to see what they can do about it to make them. So that's, that's another uh, thing. Uh, so I, as I wrote, it's very high efficiency and a long growing season. And that's one of the reasons you get more biomass. It's used in Europe as a biomass source. Steve Long have begun to explore it for about okay. Now, let's, let's go back and see how much energy we have. By the way, the names of these authors that you see, uh, Luz, uh, who is now at Caltech, he has a huge billion dollar grant, and uh, the chair, uh, uh, who was at MIT, now at Harvard, has a huge million dollar grant. And they are trying to do, uh, use uh, sort of artificial photosynthesis to see what they can do in the laboratory without the plant. And so he, he gave me a slide, uh, I, I know uh, both of them distantly, they're not you know, close friends, but I know them. And so, in this slide, which is a very well-known slide, perhaps on the internet, carbon dioxide plus water make carbohydrate oxygen in the sun. So photosynthesis, 30 terawatt 
energy. Human society in 2006 needed 30 terawatt. In 2050, they will need 30 terawatt. Very close to what photosynthesis can do. Total sunlight is 120,000 terawatt. Usable is 800 terawatt. So there is a great future of using the sunlight <coughs> for various purposes to do things for ourselves. Uh, ignore the left, it's just a nice picture that I liked. Uh, I was once in the north part of India, and I took this picture, so I like to show you my picture. But basically, uh, I asked the question, why study photosynthesis? And so I say, you study to find ways to increase food, fiber, and fuel production, reduce photorespiration. The plant, the CTD plants, the enzyme not only reacts with CO2, but with oxygen, as I said in my last lecture, those of you there. And therefore, one has to reduce it in order to make, make it better. You can convert solar energy to electricity. That's electrical engineers are involved in it. Uh, produce hydrogen gas from water. There's a lot of research going on in Colorado, in Berkeley, and many parts in Europe. I have a book coming out, which is being edited by an Italian professor, which is called hydrogen production from microorganisms. So there is there's that, that possibility <coughs> use photosynthetic reaction centers as miniature transistors and photochemicals, which is a lot of electrical engineers and people in engineering are approaching the field this way. And you can use the knowledge of photoprotection in curing cancer, which is not related to uh, biomass or bioenergy, but there is a great deal of discussion of how you can do that. And of course, offset global warming because you know you produce, use up carbon dioxide and give up oxygen. So there are a lot of many things that you can do. Uh, we can do more things. We can change the structure of the plant. We can design a new corn plant, and that's what's going on in our University of Illinois Urbana. Maybe many other places. I only know that place. They are trying to design uh, by computer engineering or computers. Uh, programming, how you can make a corn plant which would be better than the current corn plant. By the architecture of the leaves, by the canopies, by other things in the plant. So that's another area, big area. The computer scientists are very much involved and very useful for this guy. Then the next one is change absorption properties of the plant. Antenna increase or decrease. So that's another thing. So you have a plant and you have a leaf which is like this and then it's like this. And the top leaf absorbs the light and it's too much light and it's wasted light, energy, and you, you spend a lot of energy in making so much chlorophyll in the top leaf. And when the light goes down, you have less light, the lower leaves don't get it. So you have to change the architecture. And that's what also being done uh, in Urbana and I'm sure many other places. Uh, and for algae, it's being done uh, by Tasso Melis at Berkeley, and it's being done by Richard Sayre in New Mexico, and at Urbana uh, for other plants. So that's another strategy, is to reduce the amount of chlorophyll and see if you get more efficient plant. Improve primary photochemistry, this is uh, sort of my area of thinking, by decreasing competing pathways. You have, you have light loss uh, as heat, uh, some energy is lost, and maybe we can manipulate uh, in the laboratory, the chemist can perhaps produce a better chlorophyll pigment molecule that will not lose as much energy as fluorescence and heat, and more wing. So this is just a thinking, forward thinking, may or may not work. So that's another. Then, then the next one, which I've been talking to Professor Nam once in a while, decrease the bottleneck reactions. And you ask, where? So any reaction goes, is limited by the slowest reaction in the pathway. So you have to find out which is the slow code. So if your whole class is moving, uh, let's say, to another building, and the person who's slowest will dictate how, when the class reaches there. So we can make that guy hurry up, hurry up. Um, make him go faster, the class will reach faster. Therefore, we have to look for the bottleneck reaction, the limiting reactions, and in the so-called light reactions, 
there is a step in water oxidation, which is in millisecond time scale. There is a step in the plastoconone in the middle of the two photosystem, which is also in milliseconds. So we can somehow improve those reactions by genetically engineering uh, those systems. Maybe we can improve the reactions. But then we know the carbon fixation also has a millisecond pathway, and which is another enzyme to, which I talked last time is called a visco, and there you can work on that. So the, these are the other uh, areas. And then, of course, overexpressed specific enzymes. And what was discovered, again, you see, I, since I'm from Urbana, and I retired, so I talked to all the professors who were doing uh, good work, and they tell me what they have discovered. And one of the major things that have done, that was done by Jing Wang Xu, who is now in China, in Shanghai, I'm going to visit him uh, on Monday, I'm going there. And what they did was, he did a computer programming to ask the question, what is limiting in that particular plant? And they found that not Rubisco, but another enzyme, totally different enzyme, Cetoheptulose 1,7-diphosphate, was the limiting enzyme in that reaction. And when he did that, he published a paper, and they discovered that somebody had done an experiment with tobacco and showing that that was a limiting enzyme. So they discovered a limiting enzyme knowledge through this kind of research. And so that is, uh, so you can overexpress that enzyme and you have better. What more? And this is again an idea at the University of Illinois, uh, the group of Steve Long, Don Orr, and many other top plant physiologists uh, are had the idea, and I don't know it's precisely whose idea, maybe it's Professor Long's idea, I don't know, uh, maybe somebody else's idea, but the point is this, that they are the pioneers, they are pushing this area ahead, and what they are thinking, they take a cyanobacterial gene and put it in a tobacco plant first, okay, and what this gene will do, provide a more CO2 near the Robisco enzyme, and therefore, it will compete very well with oxygen and may 20% increase in the prediction. And so that is what's being attacked. And Bill Gates, a uh, philanthropist, mm -hmm. and was thinks of people, uh, worried about Africa, worried about the whole world, uh, has given uh, Steve Long and his entire group there a uh, tremendous amount of money to do this experiment on getting this gene and experiment, actual experiment, is being done in Australia by Dr. Murray Badger and his research. So that's the that. And of course, the last one, which I am personally interested in now, working with a group in Iran, the chemists, and that's find artificial ways to make biology. And I'm just not the only group. There are hundreds of those top research scientists and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's, these, that's the way. Now let's look at the cyanobacteria. Uh, this is Rim Vermas, one of the great cyanobacteriologists. He was once a student in my lab. And there are other people with him. Bob Blankenship, a great evolution person, bacteria, Chuck Dismukes, uh, who worked in oxygen evolution. And uh, some of the samples they have in the lab. So Rim Vermas and his students wrote once, we genetically engineered cyanobacteria to continuously secrete free fatty acids which can be directly collected from the culture medium. In this scheme, the cyanobacteria are not the biomass that must be processed. They're not going to biomass. They are cell factories that convert solar energy and carbon dioxide into biofuel precursors, fatty acids. Now they're, they're making biopharmaceuticals. Uh, we also has a company. Uh, I think Chinese are very much interested in, in this company. I don't know whether uh, he's collaborating with them or doing everything in Arizona. So th th these are the areas which are really very interesting for the future. So now let us look at the next point, the hydrogen evolution. So you have water and you make oxygen and hydrogen. But plants not, don't make hydrogen, but they use the hydrogen to make food for us. So again, are you competing with food? No. You have a different system, in a different laboratory, in a different place, in different lab where you can grow these cl uh, chlamydomonas and train them 
to make hydrogen rather than food. So this group, uh, there, there are several groups, one at the University of California at Berkeley, Casso Mellis, uh, and then Maria Girardi in Colorado, and with, uh, Mike Seibert was working, and then he's just retired. Um, I hope uh, he also continues to take interest in the field. He goes to the laboratory still, so that's wonderful. <coughs> so th this is the way, so you have two photosystems. Uh, photosystem two evolves oxygen. Photosystem one produces the CO2 fixation through the electron, but this enzyme hydrogenase is present in the system. And so the idea is how you can divert the electrons instead of going to CO2 fixation into taking protons which are there to make hydrogen gas. So the idea is to make hydrogen gas and oxygen. And the problem is the oxygen is an inhibitor of the enzyme hydrogenase. So now more genetic engineering is needed to see if you can make this hydrogenase so it would not be as sensitive to oxygen or physically separate where oxygen is evolved and hydrogen is produced. So those are the tricks that are now being used. So here, here is uh, uh, here is a bottle which is producing hydrogen. You can see. So the idea is sunlight, oxygenic microbes take water, make oxygen, and the oxygen goes into fuel cell, and the hydrogen goes, and then you make electricity. So that's another way. We also will use the oxygen as well to make electricity. That's one one uh, thesis, and I think. Both the groups are involved in seeing if this is feasible or not. Okay, this is actual experiment from the, um, from the group of Mellis. So what they do, they have somehow trained their chlor uh, chlorinomonas cells uh, to produce hydrogen and then normal photosynthesis in light and then a dark, it produces hydrogen uh, and then they collect the hydrogen. And so they say, well, we're not going to interfere with the system, we'll let the system run as it is, but we will collect the hydrogen in darkness when no oxygen evolution is taking place. So that's the trick that uh, they are playing. And uh, of course, uh, the idea is that you can make chemicals, as I mentioned before, you can make oxygen and biomass and make fuel as this. So th these are the things that are going on. So what is the potential? So maximum conversion efficiency uh, that they have calculated is 10 to 13 percent, which is not so bad. Uh, then land area about 100 to 100 square kilometers of 4,500. It is required to provide enough energy to fully support the United States transportation <coughs> needs uh, whenever this slide is made. This equals to about 0.12 uh, percent of the U.S. surface area. The estimated cost of the photobiological produced hydrogen could be as low as three U.S. dollars per kilogram. That is the calculation of Maria Girardi, who is working in this area. So that's also a future, very possibility that we have a good thing coming. So, not only Tasso Mellis, but many other people, I think, uh, uh, I, I have a spelling mistake there, that E has to be here. Uh, as a print, it sometimes slide moves and I don't know. Uh, so there are other, other groups of people. And by the way, I added Basham's name. And, uh, he, as I said, passed away, so I like to, it's my slides also called Calvin and Sebastian Cycle. Uh, so instead of hydrogen that we're talking about, or in addition to hydrogen, you can take, the, you can uh, manipulate the system so that instead of making sugars, it will go in a different pathway and they'll make isoprene or oil. So it's just any system. And as I mentioned before, that human mass is making certain fatty acids, we need to make oil. And in the field of comedomonas, there's another group which is also making oil. So let us look at this slide. This, this comes from the group of Tasso Mellis at the University of California, Berkeley. And he actually gave me a slide, I'm sure it's published somewhere. I don't have the reference on here. Uh, you can see oil droplets in, in the single cell. So he, these things, it's just being directed by whatever means he has created. Some of the things in this field are often patented. 
because everybody I know has also a company, and so Wimbar Mas is a company, that's what Melis has a company, and so I don't know whether all the details are open public. I certainly don't have the details, but I know the final result. Okay, so I mentioned to you about uh, loss of energy. Uh, as you can see, I, I won't dwell too much on it, but just to point out that his light intensity, and this is photosynthesis, and the rate of photon absorption is, has increases, but many times photosynthesis saturates, and this can be saturated during 75% of the day. High light intensity lead to photo inhibition, damage to photosystem too. Up to 60% of absorbed light is full, dissipated as heat. So these are the things I mentioned before. How can we change this and make it better? So, I already mentioned this, but let me just restate the idea of the Tassomelis, which is also the idea of Dixair, which is also an idea in Urbana on higher plants. These are algae uh, discussions here. So he says, okay, you have a fully pigmented system, and you have a cell, and there's more cells here, and it's very high absorbing cell, a lot of chlorophyll. Well, uh, it can do photosynthesis, but uh, certainly, but a lot of light is too much light, the plant or cell cannot handle it, so it loses heat, it's a loss. It's a loss. So, what he says we do, we make cells, uh, we do the engineering to the plant or to the cell in this case, such that it will produce less chlorophyll than more. You see, your intuition is, ah, more chlorophyll is better. But here is a matter of optics and matter of cells. Yeah? So now what you see here is in this case, uh, well, the light comes in, it goes through to the next cell, and then the next cell, and they do photosynthesis, and the heat dissipation is less because it doesn't get excess light. So this is a new way to improve algae, and the idea is being used in many laboratories. So I think this is something to remember for when you think of your own research to see if any of these ideas can help you uh, or not. So now the, the thing comes from Don Horton at Van Uh I tried to add a very small letter for him. I'm not sure if you read his name properly, so I just corrected it this morning. So you can see his name, Don Horton. But there are, when I say that one name, that doesn't mean that's the only person. It's just that person gave me the slide sometimes. So before I left, I asked, I'm lecturing here, will you help me? So sure. So here, here's an engineer plant, another engineer, a computer. Uh, so, so here you see, uh, let's say light comes in, 900 watt per meter square, sorry, it moves. And then the next one, let's say, gets 90 watts, and the next one gets 10 watts. So these are three leads, let's say, one, two, three. And let us look at, uh, in theory, what about it do. So here's another, another engineer plant. On the computer, mind you, it's not yet in the field, on the computer. Uh, and you can see, so well, let's see, uh, this leaf, one, gets a certain light, 370 watts per meter square, because it has a lower chlorophyll, and then this one gets 330 watts, this one, you know, some is of soft, it gets slightly less, this one also gets 300. So what you can see here, here the leaves are getting approximately because of the design. Now will, will, will nature allow you to make such a plant? It's a different story. But I think you have to ask the question, you have to be bold enough to try it. So that, that is what's being suggested here. And here is an actual calculations for, uh, by the way, the research is going on, at, we have, like you have institutes, we also have an institute, I'm not part of any institute since I'm retired, but there is an institute for genomic biology at Urbana, Illinois, and where they say where science meets society. So, uh, so in this, in this uh, by the way, I just said from Don, it's the first name, uh, not the last name. So there is a calculation here, and so it's a leaf one, so there's two plants here, not the one in the previous slide, you have different calculations for that. Here is simply lower curve. So here's one and two leaves, uh, one leaf here and here will give you the same photosynthesis. Okay. The second leaf, however, here, it gives less photosynthesis 
than the second leaf here because this one is getting much less light than this second leaf. And the third leaf, you can see, also slightly better. So they have calculated that this plant, like this, will be at least 10, 20 percent more efficient and productivity than this plant in the lab. Now, whether these things will work, we have to see. Uh, so they have, they have planted, they have planted some plants, uh, some strains of, uh, uh, of corn, and uh, so uh, as one was called Clark variety, and they measured the daily integral photosynthesis, and it went like that, you know, starting in July to August, and then they have another variety of same plants, but it has low chlorophyll throughout, like we predicted, and that you can see has a higher photosynthesis in July, and the total photosynthesis is much better. So there is an experimental observation that yes, this might work. Okay, so here, here is that, I don't know if I took the picture, I have a picture, but I think it was given to me by Professor Ort. Uh, and in this field, they are, they are trying to grow these different kinds of, uh, I forget uh, what plant it is, uh, different kind of plants with different chlorophyll. Uh, and so the results are not yet available fully for these plants. So what is being tried? So the other, the other person who's trying to do the same, use the same idea of lowering chlorophyll concentration and seeing if you have better photosynthesis is, as I mentioned, Dick Sayre, Richard Sayre. So here, here is the hypothesis that reducing chlorophyll B levels will decrease antenna size, reduce cell shading, and reduce energy losses, and improve the efficiency of conversion of light into gamma. The chlorophyll A is chlorophyll B, there's an enzyme, and you genetically engineer so that this enzyme will not function, and you make a construction and see what happens. So this he is doing it in the green alga, Comaremonas, and not in our plants. So these are his results, very interesting results. Uh, I don't know where it's published, but he sent me the slides for, for my lecture. Uh, so uh, he, he had found, uh, we were saying the largest, smaller antenna will have more photosynthesis, more biomass. So he did find that when he went from the normal wild type, which had a chlorophyll A to chlorophyll B ratio of 2.2, he find the one which had no chlorophyll B, the smallest antenna, had higher photosynthesis. But interestingly, and this is the kind of research that other groups should do also, he discovered, or they discovered, his group discovered, uh, that Oh, sorry, excuse me. Discovered that the intermediate antenna was not the smallest, not the biggest, but the one in between had higher photosynthesis. So basically, it is necessary to do these experiments to prove what works and what doesn't work. And so, of course, there's the theory that can be used to explain all these results, why this happened. But it's a first good demonstration of the result, and these are the different uh, uh, strain numbers of the, of the uh, organism they used. Now this is his picture. Uh, it's one of a uh, scientist from India. She's, I think he's three other from India, maybe also, I don't know. Uh, so he is the principal investigator, and they are looking at breakthroughs and opportunities. Uh, he's the director. Uh, several, like it's an you know, <laughs> director of many things, and going very well. He's a good friend of mine. So, uh, the last thing, uh, the last slide I received from him from a few days ago, he said, well, okay, we, we, we think we can go to make oil. More oil. So, in this picture, the rapid growth, fire, iron, many plants, uh, outside, unlike plants, all cells are photosynthesis high photosynthetic efficiency, a double biomass is 64 nanos, high oil content, 4 to 50 percent non photosynthetic all biomass is harvested, nothing is lost, harvested interval, not season, seasonally, every day, 24-7, as they say, sustainable, it's capture CO2, use wastewater. So the whole idea is that uh, factories are giving out all this waste, and then they, they have actually produced a farm, 
ponds where they would use the wastewater that's being produced by the factories nearby. And so no direct competition with food. So that's why I like this personally, uh, although I'm not working, I'm retired, you know. So now, uh, then, then what is the dream? I mentioned uh, in the last lecture about converting rice into C4 plant. Uh, I think everybody is doing it. Uh, everybody means a lot of people, I think, uh, uh, in Philippines, uh, in India, in US, in, in Germany, Japan, everywhere, this idea, maybe in Korea also, I'm sure, uh, is going on to see. So you just look at the C4 plants, their efficiency is high, the yield is let's say 88, and the ZMAs is also high, C4, uh, 23, but not all C4s are higher, you see. And wheat is pretty low. See, the efficiency of wheat is 0.2%, whereas penicillin is 0.8%. So basically, and this is 0.4%. So these are very low efficiency things, and it's our dream if you can improve it and for both biomass and biology. Now the new program in Urbana, funded by uh, University of Illinois Urbana, funded to Professor Steve Long, is called Light, very nice name. Uh, so it says, realizing increased photosynthetic efficiency for sustainable increases in coffee. That's the title. Uh, Tremendous amount of funding uh, for this research. So why is it right now? It's an interesting twist in the word, English language. Is it right to do it? It's supported by the right grant. Uh, so photosynthesis is known in more detail than any other process. I, in the last four lectures, I tried to present to you uh, many things that we know. Then today, the computer and science departments, uh, they are produce beautiful computers, the high computing, uh, super computer, high performance is now available. Uh, crop transformation is becoming increasingly routine, uh, but the easiest still tobacco. So many of the research goes on first to tobacco and then it'll be transferred. Bill Gates has been told and told uh, that first tobacco and then we transfer the knowledge to other plants. So here, here is a build, uh, here is a field that uh, there is in the University of Illinois Urbana. Nice big field. They can do a lot of experiments. It's called soil fish, uh, uh, and they have produced many plants with different efficiencies. And the whole idea is to improve it through the methods that I just discussed with you a moment ago. And there are some some stuff, some text that Steve Long uses in his lectures, and he's kind enough to give me. So increasing photosynthesis does affect the yield increase, increase yield. This is known. Uh, photosynthesis is the major remaining means to increase potential. Others, ag agriculture, agriculturists have always done all the plant breeding they could do, and therefore there's no mu not much hope for the plant breeding method. Has proved less tractable to classic breeding approaches, but tractable to genetic engineering. So that's the future, how to make it. That's one thing. Then he says the process can be simulated in silico. That's the big computer you saw. Evolutionary algorithms suggest the potential to increase leap for 60% without additional research. That's a big increase. Results are consistent with limited transgenic manipulation that has already been done. So these are some of the plants that are growing, hoping. Uh, transplanting a better rubisco is said in a synthetic way, could increase carbon gain by 31% with cyanobacterial gene engineering. That's what I've been saying. It's kind of conclu conclusions in text form. A better light distribution within the canopy could increase carbon gain by 40% with less resource sustainability gain. So this is also what I told you about the chlorophyll content, decreasing it, uh, and therefore you putting less energy into making chlorophyll. So that's another Well, that's one of the students, and maybe I don't recognize her, maybe I do. <laughs> maybe she's wearing glasses. So this is some of the things that are being done in the field, and there are pictures of them being taken. Now, why haven't, so the next question is, we have had evolution for years together. Why hasn't evolution done it better for us? So, the argument was made in one of the papers, and Zhu is also, Jing Wang Zhu is also co-author, not me. 
<laughs> why has an evolution done this? The wild selection for survival. Plants are there to survive so they don't get killed. Fecundity, so they have more and competitive success. So agriculture productivity and resource conservation. Photosynthesis is highly concerned. Little natural variation. What works for one probably works for all is the thinking. So basically, uh, the plants evolve for a different reason and we want to change the plant for our benefit because we know we have knowledge to do that. So uh, there are some experiments to uh, publish in Australia. In fact, uh, I know Fred Chow, a friend of mine, uh, to show it, it was slide they put it together from past literature, leaf photosynthesis and years of release. And there is a dwarf, semi-dwarf varieties. I think Swaminathan in India worked very hard for the Green Revolution, uh, which showed that you, you can have increase with dwarf, dwarf varieties. It's called the Green Revolution. And as well, about 1% per decade is increased, but very slow. But now we're thinking of big jumps with the experiments that I described to you. Well, this, we talked about the extra, extra too much light in which uh, but we talk about now photorespiration. Photorespiration means oxygen reacts with the enzyme and therefore no food is produced. And so we need to do something about it. And uh, here is a list, again, uh, the three authors that I mentioned their names already, Ting Yong Zhu, who, who had come to Urbana, now in Shanghai, Steve Long and Don Lord, uh, have an annual review, plant biology review, and they, they show you percent increase in relative to current value, speculative time horizon, when. So you, you produce something which will bypass for the respiration, maybe in five to ten years. Maybe you can improve canopy architecture, I was talking about profile distribution, and then maybe uh, within ten years, zero to ten years, they only begin to show some results. Increased rate of recovery from photo protection, uh, that is find ways to manipulate the system so it don't lose heat and uh, they expect one to ten years. Introduction of higher foreign rubisco, we're talking about that, cyanobacteria or not, uh, maybe ten, more than ten years. Altered allocation of resources, maybe uh, some possibility and as I mentioned before, introduction of cyanobacteria due to concentrating mechanism. This already begins to do this research now. So this is the tobacco plant that they already showed that existed, the literature existed in 2005 that when they overexpressed uh, one gene, cigarette uh, this phosphate carboxylate gene, phosphatase gene I mean, uh, then the plant had much higher photosynthesis uh, and more growth. So uh, that was predicted much later <laughs> uh, uh, in this paper, uh, but it's now shown uh, to be really true, not Rubisco, but a different enzyme. Uh, I don't want to talk about this slide, it's just a, a dream slide about all the things I've talked about. This was given to me very kindly and generously by Steve Long, uh, but I don't have time to discuss everything. It's just that all the things summarized here of what they're doing, better Rubisco, optimize uh, carbon cycle, you put cyanobacterial gene, uh, you have more rapid recovery from photo inhibition and you redesign the canopy and all those things is kind of summary uh, slide of doing it. Now, uh, they're also trying to work on sugarcane and sweet sorghum and I will not dis di uh, discuss it in detail but I'll point out to you the biodiesel potential of different crops. Some sugarcane, oil, oil palm, canola, soya. So you can see the sugar cane and all these plants, sweet sorghum, they have much better potential of uh, making uh, biodiesel. So that's another approach. Uh, several groups are involved in that. Uh, no, I don't have to show you the slide. Think kind of uh, how much increase in oil uh, by upregulating uh, certain genes, you can see. So you have one, two, three, and you have all the combined, you, you can have much higher increase in oil, and then a few bit add more, it's less, so it's better to have this uh, done uh, this way. So that's another uh, suggestion. So um, ultimately, you need to calculate uh, the energy loss. So if you see, the sun gives 1,000 kilojoules, 
then you see what happens to it. So much light is already lost, uh, it's not active. We talked about that. Can we, can we capture it by changing and genetically engineering photosystem one? Uh, that's another approach. Uh, some is reflected and transmitted. Well, you can change it by maybe chlorophyll changes, photochemical inefficiency we talked about, then carbohydrate synthesized. Photorespiration is very low in C4 plants, so maybe you can convert C3 to C4 plants. So basically, uh, C4 plants are better, uh, more efficient than C3 plants. C3 potential is, let's say, 0 0.046, and C3, C4 potential 0 0.060 in this, uh, in this language. And so it's a change, very important change. And so, just to know, uh, what are the things that uh, relate to these biomass increases? Uh, you can see uh, the total solar energy you cannot change. The sun is there, whatever is there. Uh, conversion efficiency and interception. So they are trying to change the interception efficiency. They are trying to change the conversion efficiency. And of course, in the partitioning efficiency, what goes to the food, what goes to leaf. Uh, that agriculture people already work very hard for that. So I don't think we can do anything. Now I asked some folks to give me some, by the way, I'm going to slide goes into PC changes, so I'm sorry for that, but it's okay. Just to give you a feeling what Bob Forman thinks, he has interest in issues of food security, biofuels, and climate. Is good for solar. So everybody must, must think about it, and photosensitive is one of the best that you find disciplines, so we have a responsibility to provide that knowledge. So that's why I'm here to, to, to convince you to do research in photosynthesis. Uh, well, there are more more things written. Uh, we, we talked about uh, making rice a C4 plant. Uh, we talked about how to change. We didn't talk about it. There are many, many issues. I don't want to, do, don't want to go through all of them. There's a CO2 diffusion problem. Uh, could you have a partial C4 pathway and still be better? Which part of Rubisco uh, should work? Uh, can you genetically manipulate it? What are the structural determinants? Because as I mentioned last time, your methyl cell and bundle sheet cells, can we do something, change the ratio? I need to understand how plants respond to environmental, figure out the interface between light harvesting and down. So these are just general things that are being said uh, to, for us not to forget. And I asked uh, two other scientists uh, what they think. Uh, as you know, I'm retired, so it uh, depends on a lot of friends, uh, what they think. Tom Sharkey at Michigan State University, and Will Ashton, Estonia. And he, uh, Tom thinks uh, we must understand how regulation takes place. Because we don't, maybe we do all these things and uh, we may uh, not work after a while. So understanding of how enzymes are uh, compartmentalized is needed. How carbon benzene cycle and reactions are coordinately regulated. So there is a, he is saying, that don't ignore regulation processes because you, you think you were solving problem, but then you may not. So therefore, think of the regulation mechanism and work of also regulatory mechanism before you are too happy. So uh, now the last thing, again, I say this like to move from one system to the other. Uh, so we're going to artificial photosynthesis a little bit. So uh, this is Tommy Rizinski, who was uh, my PhD student long ago. He's also retired now. Uh, and this is Margaret Filia, who is now a professor. He's also, uh, he's, both of them are not well physically at the moment. So their own world demand for energy is rapidly increasing. It's projected to more than double by the year 2050. Sunlight accounts for the largest in energy input in the Earth's surface, providing more energy in one hour than all of the energy consumed by the entire planet in one year. So, we need to use this for artificial photosynthesis. So, the idea of the chemist is, well, okay, you biologists go do the field work, do all the molecular biology. We sit in the lab and we see if you can do better than you. So, let us see if they can. And there's a big field, another big field that the chemists are doing. So, there's artificial photosynthesis. Uh, some groups, like in Arizona, Tom Moore and Amur, then Gus, they, they are actually physically creating uh, pigment molecules, tying them together, and seeing uh, if they will work better. So that's an, another direction of research uh, in artificial photosynthesis. This is the work that I mentioned from Tom Witteziski did, 
And so he said, okay, I'm going to take a system and I'm going to artificially create a system which eventually may make oxygen and nitrogen. Now, did he succeed? I know, well, he retired, uh, and I suppose other people will hopefully take it up. But what they did succeed is in taking, uh, the ma putting two manganese and a zinc compound, this is a manganese, a magnesium chlorophyll compound, and they put a tyrosine and amino acid, which is a natural system, and they, they did have some kind of charge separation, uh, some kind of electricity, and this is the natural system, uh, reaction center chlorophyll, uh, the tyrosine and the magnesium capsule. So this is the hope. Uh, now the people in bacterial field, uh, Jim Allen uh, in Arizona State University, he's taking the bacterial reaction center and putting magnesium in and seeing if we can make the bacterial reaction center do oxygen evolution ultimately, or at least charge separation and get electricity out of it. So that's, those are the uh, other. Now I put a one of my posters uh, that I presented, this is the work being done with the chemist in Iran, uh, Madina Jafur, a young chemist. Uh, so what they have done, they have taken manganese oxide and they have put a phenol group and they put in a protein, bovine serum alcohol. And when they did that, uh, Madi's group, Najafur uh, is the name, uh, he was able to get oxygen. The slide is not very good because I just cut the poster and put it here. Uh, so he was able to get oxygen evolution. His system is a kind of phenol uh, in the system, and this is the whole idea of making oxygen and protons, and the whole idea is taking protons with, uh, and electrons are coming and make hydrogen. So this is at infancy stage. Uh, at least he has succeeded in getting oxygen evolution from this complex. And I have not had uh, contact with him since uh, I left uh, Arana. Uh, we'll find out what more he has done, succeeded in. But this is not the only group. There are many groups. There are Germany, in France, a very large group in France, one group in England, several groups in the United States who are also trying different approaches of this kind. So here, here is a famous Daniel Ochara, MIT. Uh, is now hired by the Harvard University. He says, he claims that with just one bottle of drinking water and four hours of sunlight, he can generate 30 kilowatts hour of electricity and of the power of the entire home. This is the claim of Professor Nature. Uh, I am sure he has reasons to claim this. He said this process consists, he is using cobalt-based catalysts that uses solar energy to split water and produce hydrogen. While using the electric energy obtained from a 30 square meter photovoltaic array, Nocerna's catalyst converts CO2 and water into oxygen and hydrogen. The process just like photosynthesis, he says. So it's a big uh, thing. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, the details of his experiments, but this, these are the statements made in Science Magazine and made many, many other places. And I think it's a very hopeful thing if uh, it's right. And this is Melvin Carlin, whose name I've mentioned before. And uh, I don't think this is the right slide. <laughs> I changed the slide, but somehow it went back, changed his face, but that's OK. I wrote an article with uh, several people uh, in Royal Society of Chemistry, a short article, two-page article, telling people to be very cautious. If you use certain chemicals, and if they are carcinogenic to us, you may attain what your goal is, but then you may have difficulty. Maybe you will kill the people <laughs> for whom you made this. So therefore, we suggest caution. We suggest caution. We prefer that people use manganese and others that are in a natural system. But we do not say that they should not use the other system. Use it in the laboratory, because whatever they discover will be very useful. And if it is contained in the laboratory, it's OK. But you have to be cautious. So that's the point of our letter to the Royal Society of Chemistry. And I had a sign, uh, I should say, by people from different countries. Uh, Madina Jafur from Iran, Jim Barber from England, Professor Shen from Japan, Gary Moore from USA, and myself 
So we said green leaf powered by true photosynthesis, offering inspiration for clean energy. We suggest that we must use natural manganese calcium system instead of toxic metals. And I'm not saying they should not use it. I'm saying not to let it loose in the environment. And this is the correct slide <laughs> of Melvin Kalman. Uh, say this, this is a center, it's a very heavily funded center at California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, and jointly with the University of California at Berkeley. And so it's called Joint Center of Artificial Purposes. It's a big center, and the center is to demonstrate a manufacturable, scalable solar fuels generator using earth abundant elements that with no oil robustly produces fuel so the sun is ten times more efficient than the current crops. <laughs> that's, that's what is the goal of this whole project. And I don't know, perhaps there are 100 people working on this project. Uh, I know one person who I contact and talk to, and his name is uh, Gary Moore. And here is Gary with me. Uh, was receiving an award of a book from me many, many years ago, many, many years ago, uh, as one of the top scientists in this group. And uh, finally, my last slide, it's a science fiction slide, <laughs> I say, well, our cars could operate in electricity instead of bioalcohol, made from plants and algae, that is, electricity would come from plants and algae, and the bioalcohol made either from corn or grasses or miscanthus will be used, biodiesel made from algae or from cyanobacteria, photovoltaic based artificial photosynthesis. So what I, my thesis is this, it is not a matter of this method or that method. We have to consider all methods and we have to choose a method that best suits our purpose, best suits our country, best suits what we are interested in. And therefore one should not say this is good or this is bad. Well, you can say these things are not good in this in this technique, or these things are not, but we cannot deny, we should let all possibilities be looked at uh, at this time. And I have just a fun slide here, because just to tell you that there are sea slugs which eat chloroplasts, put in their body, and they don't have to eat food. Okay. So they live off the entire life, then they die, and when the children are born, the sea slugs, the little babies are born, they also uh, take in chloroplasts, they eat, and then they also live uh, their whole life without eating anything on the outside. So there is a symbiotic relationship between the two. Well, there's a kind of fun slide that I'd like to show. Uh, I say the sea slug lives its life from chloroplast which had eaten and incorporated in its body. Would humans do that? Would they want to do that? I don't know. I don't want to put chloroplast in the body. But that's just for fun, I think. Maybe this is my last slide. Uh, I like to... Uh, I may have made a mistake in uh, this, so please correct me. So I say the firefly seems a fire. The sky, by the way, it's not my quotation, it's come from one of the, one of the scriptures in the Hindu uh, society. Uh, I would forget where, because I'm not a very religious person. But it said uh, from Sanskrit, it was translated into English, uh, it's in the internet, the firefly seems a fire, the sky looks flat, yet the sky is flat, and either this or that. Meaning thereby, when we look at things, we, we can't be sure that this is this or that. So we, we have to question. We always must question everything. And I had a Buddha slide which shows the questioning. Uh, you question yourself as well. So my heart is thanks to all those who came to listen to this last lecture. And I don't know whether I is correctly stated. Gams Gamsa Nam Dina? No? Dina? Gamsam Nida? Is it okay? Maybe not quite correct, but thank you very much for coming and for letting me come to visit your wonderful country.